Now then, I'm Justin Ellie, and I was born at Middle Row in Wasdale Head, and I now live down at Glendale in another Wasdale. I've done a lot of running in the mountains on my own, you know, the solid of it and the views, the Lake District. It's the most beautiful part of the world. It doesn't matter where you go, when you come back home, the Lake District is something special. A lot of great memories, you know, although when I did the 70 at 70, you know, we come down off uh, Greik, down that gill, and we're looking across towards Kelton Fell in there, and there was a white mist just lying through the fields, and you could see the hedges and the trees out of it. And that day, it, the sun got out, there was no clouds above, and when we were going up on the airstacks, I stopped for two or three minutes just to look down bottom here. The lakes were like giant looking glasses. You could see everything in the lake clearer than what it was out. It was just one of those magical days, and the colour of the water was just right. Like, you know, there wasn't a breath of wind, and uh, you look back at days like that. And going up on the Green Gable, you know, when at, at a dirt, certain time of the year, uh, and looking down to uh, Black Beck Tarn and, and Buttermay and Crummock Water. There's just one thing short, and that was uh, Lowe's Water should have been moved round and we'd have got all the three in. So he left to do a bit of trick photography someday and get, get it put on a photograph. But, you know, it's an absolute beautiful shot of, of the Lake District, is that? And, you know, it's the same if you're going on to Westman Cairn and, and the, the light is right, you know. There's places like that where it sticks in your mind, like, you know, and it's the same if you had black sail huts when the sun's starting to go down and it's sort of reflecting off the water and why the best up in the, the back of the gables, like, you know. It's them sort of places you sort of think, well, I'm lucky to, to live near and, and be able to go and, and see these sights and, and catch the right light, like, you know. When I was running, you know, I used to, if I had time, I would just go and do a big long run, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'd just come back home and have a bite to eat and maybe just wash my legs in the back. And never used to take anything out of us, really, like, because I used to try and run as relaxed as possible on a long stride and I used to just eat the ground up. And my climbing was really good in them days, like, you know, I could jog up Kirkfell or anything like that, you know, fairly easy. And, uh, you know, little body could take it, no bother, like. You know, like. Now then, I think it was just through doing a lot of work, like, you know, uh, I went to the a lot of, of shape, you know. I, used to, I, was, I went towards 2000 on, and you'd maybe dip 17 or 18 hundred in a day if, if you had the mean when you dip it. And, uh, you know, we used to dip them through a little sort of a doorway into the dipping tub. You used to grab them by the tail under the chin and get a knee in the ribs. And, you know, when you'd done that over 17 hundred times and, and down between your legs, you know, that. That, 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 that was a sign of your fitness, like, you know. I, you know, if I go out, I try and take a tag that's waterproof up the point. Yeah. And uh, I always have two lots of thermal gear with it, you know. Uh, even if one in the pocket, you know, top. And if I get cold, I'll, I'll just take that one out of my pocket and put it next to my skin, the other one on top of it. And then put my cag on as well if it becomes too cold. Yeah. You know, it, the upper body's got to be kept warm. Because, you know, like running a the trail there today, if, if you didn't keep your body, upper body warm and you start losing body heat up there, you soon start to go slower. It slows your body down, like, because the, the energy's going to the wrong place. It's trying to keep you warm, like, instead of, you know, like making you run faster. And it, it's got to be slowing you up, like, you know. Ah, uh, Rick is a good lad. Uh, he's a very genuine person, he's Ricky Lightfoot. And I tell you what, if... He just had a little bit more pace. He'd run some great marathons. You know, he went on the road. Uh, he's got maybe he's got a little bone structure, you know, which is slightly against him. But I tell you what, he works hard, and I think he's worked hard for everything he's done. Like you know, and I wish Ricky well because he's a very, very sensible, good lad. Like you know, he's good for our sport. Like you know, when he's fit, he gives 100 percent. You know, and uh, he's the sort of man we want to send on our running trips abroad, like, which he does go, like, you know, but, uh, well, all us think about tomorrow when you're doing these things, because, you know, it's no good knocking hell out of yourself and uh, destroying your bone structure and your joints and that. When you're coming down steep hills and that, all this come down with your knees slightly bent. None of this digging your heels in and going to 100 mile an hour, go to 100 mile an hour with your knees slightly bent and just 
get that vision in your uh, sights if you do make a slip where you can gather yourself. You know, try and not take knocks. Because, you know, if you break bones and that, it, there's always a weakness there. Uh, and, you know, think about tomorrow. I admired all the good runners, uh, uh, you know, because I know what a lot of them lads were putting in, like, you know, they run 100 miles a week and that sort of thing, and, you know, and the, the, doing the pace work and that sort of thing. But the only way to run fast is run on sand and run out, you know, in, in soft sand and, and get your legs really strong, you know, it matter how little bone or your structure you've got or how little the muscles are. Run out in that strong wind, you know, for five or six miles if you can on as long a stride as you possibly can, you know, get your body strong and used to running in that strong wind, and when you get to the far end, turn and run as fast as you can as though you're going to knock yourself, and then hold that stride, you're coming back, you know, for the six or seven mile, and then you will run fast. These little short bursts, now they stand for nothing. You've got to sustain your uh, pace for long periods of time if you're going to run fast. And, and, and win long races like you know and it can be put there you've just got to do these sort of things and be very very hard on yourself where you're making yourself strong to run into these strong winds and you know really punish yourself going out you know and then get stuck in coming back with the wind behind you if you can find somewhere like that if you can't run fast after that you'll never run fast and I'd, I've never used these energy gels it's, I know I was doing one of them long runs once and somebody sent us a box full of you know and I thought it was taking more energy getting the paper off than what I was getting out of the bar when I ate it like. So the secret is really, you want, you know, something like glucose with a little bit of salt in, but not enough to make it taste too salty. And you want something like egg mayonnaise with a bit of tomato in, and just enough for a couple of good mouthful. And, you know, make it really moist and wrap it up in a little bit of clay oil. And so you can just put it in your mouth and put enough salt in it to, so you can taste, just taste it. There's most of the vitamins not in there that the body needs to, you know, replace anything you're losing, like, you know. I won't probably be doing the uh, people who make these fancy bars any good. They come out with stories like that, but, you know, that's, that's genuinely right, like, you know. We just don't seem to have that nucleus of young fell runners who, uh, like says Ricky, we could do it another half dozen Rickies and one would push the other, like, you know, and you go even faster, like, you know. We just need that nucleus of young lads coming on. Uh, and we've thought about this. We put youth races on here in the early days, and, you know, there's, there's nobody, you know, that, that's come to, I would say, race them hardly. You know, you might be used to get about half a dozen or a dozen, and then following year, it, it just dwindles on coming, which was sad, really, because... I know Joe Long at the time, going back in the uh, early 70s and, you know, later 60s when we put the, started putting the end of the race on, you know, he had big ambitions in, in bringing youth forward. But there was just no youth to come because he was going to put a, a race up on the Crag Fell. I think he maybe did put one or two on and the numbers weren't there to sub, some, some, you know, numbers to carry on with it, like, you know. I would like to play cricket at the top, like, ah, you know, because, you, you know, you know, your reflexes have got to be sharp and your concentration's got to be good. And all of these top batsmen, top bowlers, like you know, uh, they put a lot of pressure on themselves, and they've got to be spot on. You know, when the ball comes at you 100 mile an hour, you know, you haven't got to make any mistakes. Like, you've got to put it where you want it. And until you get the middle and the, hitting the ball in the, with, you know, in the, with the middle of the bat, it's a technique on its own. You know, a lot of people don't realise the skills in cricket and, and, and them sort of ball games where they come out of your pace like you know the concentration they've got to have is you know out of this world really he was a great mate of mine was Harry I was he wanted us to run you know and concentrate on the running and he, he come to me one day and he, 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 he wanted to take us out for a run and he said I could win any race on the road on the fells if I trained and you know put me in mind to it and I said you're talking about a rubbish boy and uh, he was adamant, like, you know. And when I moved down to Bowderdale, like, he would come over from Langdale maybe at night time, and he had his big rucksack on his back, you know, and he would shout in my bedroom window, and I'd look out and i said, do you want anything, Eric? And I, and I said, are you all right? He said, are you all right? I said, aye. He said, that's all I want to know. And he would turn around and he would go. 
And they had been I mean, the same for another 12 months, like. Aye, but Eric, you know, he was one of those sort of fellows when you were with him, he would get a jam booty off anybody, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it, in a nice way, like, it, it's, it, you have the jam booty because I'm, you know, getting a bit hungry, like, you know, and it, the, way, the way he sort of presented it, like, it was unique as though the whole of a sandwich, like, you know, it, it, it was a good, and he was a great rock climber. And anywhere where there's a few kids about and he had a bit of spare time, he'd have a couple of uh, jackets down on the ground, like, and he'd be playing football with them. And he was good with them, like, you know. And, you know, it, some people used to say, well, he was a bit of a cadge and this sort of thing. It was his way of life, you know. He used to come over at Wasso the pub and he would uh, wash dishes overnight, you know, just to get his dinner. And he'd go climbing next day on the fells, like. I can always remember going up onto Scorpio Pike one morning and I met two lots of people and one had been to Austria and he had seen Eric and he was uh, running a, a chairlift and another one had seen him going cart and uh, camera up onto this fellow for a film crew like you know and it, it's a small world isn't it like you know uh, but Eric was a great bloke like he come to the sad end like you know and he got killed in that car crash when he was he was going to do a 24 hour run on a track at uh, I think it was about Liverpool or somewhere and he got killed on the motorway, which was awfully sad, like, you know. Uh, but uh, Eric was Eric, but it was just, just, a, just a one-off, like. He loved to sing song, like, and she get the old guitar out, like. And he spent a lot of time at Wasslad, like, you know. Uh, and I had a lot of good memories with him, because he used to get us out to run, like, you know, and he used to try and get us to go and do races and that sort of thing, but I hadn't a lot of time to do. And, you know, he, he used to try and encourage us to do it, like, you know. Uh, Alan Demandis, Alan did a lot for the sport, like, you know, you know, a lot of fast Bob, Bob Grahams and all them sort of things. And, you know, she set a standard for other girls to follow, you know, which was what we needed at that time, you know. It just gave it a boost. But the young lady of Scotland there now, she's got a lot of ability. And there's another young lady from, uh, now then, lives in Liverpool. Uh, and she would win the marathon at uh, Langdale. And the week before, she won a trial race somewhere, and it was 50 miles, the one, and, you know, she'd hardly done any running before. And, uh, you know, she'd got a lot of ability, and she just needs someone to take her under the wings and, and just, you know, steady her up and get her mind sorted and get her into it right, like, you know, because I was talking to the mother, and, she, you know, she said she was very keen, and she was backing her and taking her to race and that sort of thing. But uh, the ability's there, like, you know... Uh, we could just do it a few more like it coming through, like, you know. Ian Holmes. <laughs> he's a really great lad, is Ian, isn't he? Well, he's run for years and years at the top, like, you know. And he's always the same as Ian. He's got a smile on his face and, you know, he always gives it what he, the, his best shot. You know, his knees have gone now and he can run for about an hour. But he still turns up and runs his, at, at, at the best he can for that hour, like, you know. I, I know one day... Uh, I ran up Scorpio Park and it was, it was just the perfect day like you know and I went up and down in uh, 47 minutes but you know there was a helicopter film was coming down and it it was just a myth really because this old commanding officer rang up about a week before and he said oh he said, yeah, these uh, four uh, officers doing the uh, three pigs by helicopter and we'd have taken them up Scorpio Park and I said that's okay and, I said, what time do you want us? He said, oh, at the wooden bridge below Bracken Close at 2 o'clock. So I got up at 2 o'clock, and my friend from Newcastle, my wife's friend, was staying. John Sutherland, they call him. Both fellow he isn't here anymore. And uh, we go up to uh, the bridge, and here's the helicopter parked in my brother's field. And uh, the commanding officer came walking across. And he said, oh, he said, my boys have gone an hour. I said, oh, I said, no, oh, that's a bit unfortunate. And I said to John, well, I said, I've never seen it. What time I can run up and down Scorpio Pike? I said, you just time us. And uh, anyways, I went a bit river to the bottom of a little brown tongue. I crossed back there and I just took off. And I didn't half leg it out to the edge of Sour Ground, what we call Sour Ground. And I cut sort of a, little, a long skyline at, to Crags, till the main crag. And then I sprinted across the cane and I catched my boys just before they got to the top line. And anyways, I just touched the cane and then I dropped down with that top bit. And just so you pass the main cane, you know, where you go off to uh, Mickledore. I just turned there and cut across them stones, and the little scree bed runs down beside the crag that uh, sort of runs out into that green just below it. And I wouldn't half legging it down there. 
in New York, and I said, hell, hell, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And he said to uh, Bob Armstrong, he said, just film him down to the bottom. And I was just coming under this bit better ground then, and the downdraft of the helicopter was holding us, and he could go like a rocket, and I sprinted down, down to the bottom like, and I was... I And I said to John, I said, well, how long did that take, John? He said, 47 minutes. And I never thought out more about it till uh, Italians come over for the Schofield race. And uh, they, I think one of them might have done for 50 minutes like, aye, aye. And I thought, well, that time I did, maybe it wasn't a bad time after all, like, you know. It was just the right day for it, like, you know. And you, you know, the lower legs were all right, and I was just right. And uh, I had a bad patch. And, I didn't push it too hard early on, but when I did, you know, get into it, when I caught that steep ground, I didn't half leg it. Yeah. Uh, and it uh, went really well at the top. And that's, that's the answer. If your climbing's right, the job's good. Uh,